Happy Halloween and welcome to Cheddar Innovates, brought to you by Curiosity Stream. I'm Nora Ali. And I'm Tim Stenevec. Cheddar teamed up with Curiosity Stream to bring you the latest trends, innovations, and breakthroughs that are shaping our future. Check out thousands of titles on science, nature, history, and technology only on Curiosity Stream. So let's get started with some of the news we are following for you today. Starting out in California, the winds in California are expected to continue to reach hurricane strength, fanning more than 20 wildfires across the southern part of the state. New fires broke out in and around San Bernardino overnight, causing evacuation throughout the area. Firefighters are battling the fires from the ground and from the air, but as soon as they get a fire under control, another one seems to pop up. Yesterday, firefighters worked desperately and successfully to save the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library as flames came within 30 yards of the monument. The library, overlooking Simi Valley, was also helped by, one, by hundreds of goats brought in earlier this year to create a fire break or buffer zone by eating the brush. Nearly one million people remain without power and up and down the state as utility crews try to prevent even more fires from breaking out. Alyssa Julia Smith is on the scene with the latest. Alyssa, take it away. Thanks so much, Tim. I'm here at the command post for the Getty Fire in Los Angeles, right here at UCLA. And now this is where all the firefighters basically come for resources, for medical, to refill the tankers, restock supplies. Um, and this is also where they sleep. So this is essentially their home base for all the firefighters tirelessly working on the Getty Fire. But there is some good news for the Getty Fire here. Most evacuations have been lifted here around that area. It's now 39% contained, which is a huge... Uh, huge stride. It's only about 745 acres. So there's a lot of good news here in Southern California. Now we're going to go to some of those other new fires you were touching on, Tim. The newest fire is the 46 fire. This one broke out overnight around 1.30 in the morning and it's about 300 acres and 5% contained. This is in the Harupa Valley and uh, it is spreading over to Riverside area. Now the hillside fire is the one you were also talking about in San Bernardino. That one, there, the mandatory evacuations uh, are in place there. That one broke out last night as well. And it's about 1.30, about 1.30 a.m. and it's crossed around 200 acres. Uh, now they just held a press conference and this is what we know. Six homes have been uh, damaged in two buildings. There's 500 firefighters on that scene uh, in San Bernardino and it's 0% uh, or now it is 5% contained as mentioned previously. So the easy fire, this is the one we were co covering yesterday. This is in Ventura County, which is right over the hill here. 30,000 people are under mandatory evacuation orders, and uh, that one is over 1,600 acres. It's 5% contained as of 7.30 a.m. this morning Pacific time. We have 1,000 firefighters on the scene there. Um, basically up north, uh, one glass update for you, the Kincaid fire. We have some progress there as well. Uh, it's 45% contained, which is a lot of progress. And that is the one, of course, in the Sonoma Valley area. So we're going to keep it there uh, and send it back over to you guys in New York. Uh, from Alyssa Julia Smith on the ground in Southern California. Stay safe, Alyssa. We'll, of course, bring you more updates as we get them on those fires. In other news here, a new report by climate scientists warns that we may have underestimated how much of the global coastline will be underwater in 30 years. The new research, published in the journal Nature Communications, used AI to more accu accurately calculate land elevation. The study found that 150 million people in the world are currently living in areas that will be under the high tide line by 2050. Global sea levels are expected to rise between 2 to 7 feet over the course of the 21st century. The map on the left here that you're seeing shows the old predictions for rising sea levels by 2050. And the map on the right shows the new outlook. Places that will be under the high tide line include a quarter of the population of Vietnam, much of Bangkok, downtown Shanghai, and nearly all of Mumbai. The scientists argue that cities need to heavily invest in protective barriers like seawalls in the coming years. So essentially this research is highlighting that countries have to take action even sooner than expected. There's also this worry of cultural heritage disappearing. One of the cities, Alexandria, Egypt, of course, founded by Alexander the Great, could be lost to rising water. So time to take action. Absolutely time to take action. It's a time where the, the entire world needs to come together to understand that the, uh, the, the threat from this is absolutely real, real and they need to start doing something and not just to protect these cities, yeah. but also changing the way that we live, changing right. what we eat, changing how we get to places mm -hmm. uh, because the repercussions of this are far wide and vast. I mean, if you think right. about where people live, 
the types of food they get. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the story that Alyssa was just talking yeah, about right. just now, yep. climate change, heavy winds, dry conditions in California, these things are not unrelated mm -hmm. and it's something that we need to talk about uh, and we need to learn more about. Very true. Not just regulation from a federal or global level, even it's individuals like us making new decisions Exactly. As well. Well, the U.S. government is offering a contract to a private company that researches UFOs, but officials are not necessarily interested in aliens. The company called To The Stars Academy, or TTSA, was started in 2017 by former Blink-182 guitarist Tom DeLonge. That year, it made a splash by becoming the first company to release videos showing Navy pilots interacting with what could be a UFO. But the TTSA is interested in more than just extraterrestrials. It also has a division focused on developing new technology. And that is why the U.S. Army has reportedly signed the company to a cooperative research and development agreement. The five-year contract will provide TTSA with nearly a million dollars in funding. In exchange, the company will help the Army to research and develop cutting-edge technologies, ranging from quantum communication to energy propulsion. I haven't seen any aliens yet on Halloween. Have you? Uh, just you. Just me. Just kidding. I haven't seen any little uh, green men. No, not at all. But I mean, this is interesting because usually UFO truthers don't get a lot of credit or people don't believe them. But UFO, let's not forget, it's not just aliens. Yeah, exactly. It's unidentified flying objects. So it could be anything. But the TTSA has some clout within the UFO community. Overall. It really does. <laughs> and we're totally burying the lead, not talking more about Tom, Tom DeLong and Blink-182 <laughs> here, right? He's part of the reason why there's he, so much clout. For I know. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. <laughs> We'll see some uh, one of our colleagues, Chris, went and saw Blink-182 perform right. recently. He was very excited to have sort of the UFO uh, uh -huh. overhang in the right. entire thing. Right. He's really happy about it. <laughs> Love it. Okay, <laughs> in other news here, NASA is sharing some spooky space pictures just in time for Halloween. NASA posted this image of a galactic ghoul captured by the Hubble Space Telescope. It's actually a titanic head-on collision between two galaxies. Hopefully, we'll see it. There it is. The things that look like the eyes are the cores of the galaxies. The outline of the face is a ring of blue stars. NASA also posted this next image where the sun looks a lot like a fiery jack-o'-lantern. <gasps> it does. The agency's Solar Dynamics Observatory captured the ultraviolet image back in October 2014. The areas that look like the eyes and mouth are brighter because they emit more light and energy. It shows the magnetic fields hovering in the sun's atmosphere. I guess if you're looking for it, it can look like anything, but that one I think is good. That's the sun looking like a pumpkin. The that's first one, I didn't really buy the first one. That's absolutely legit. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's absolutely legit. But the best thing that, about this is what the agency does uh -huh. is, is they're very good at marketing. And they're very good at garnering interest, yes, right? Yes. And creating interest around this stuff. Right. And I think it's great because it gets us talking, it gets kids interested, and it gets people interested in learning more about it. In space, because commercial space flight is going to be a thing very soon. Well, coming up, virtual reality is taking on a scary cult classic. We're going to hear from the producer of The Exorcist Legion VR right after this. I'm already a little scared. <laughs>
Welcome back to Cheddar Innovates, brought to you by Curiosity Stream. That's us, Tim. Look. Did you see that? That's that's us. I did not know that's us. <laughs> you didn't even notice. I didn't. I wasn't oh looking at the TV. I'm a space woman, words. and you're Indiana Jones. <laughs> I guess I love it. Okay, cool. <laughs> Well, the, did you like that? I like that. I can't I, believe you didn't I, notice. I didn't notice that at all. Oh my god. Totally that's just cute, reading guys. the words on yes, the screen That's instead. what we do for our job. Okay, yeah. moving on here. The global... <laughs> Good work, everybody. Good work. The, room, the global funny. augmented... <laughs> in a second. Sorry <laughs> for okay. ruining your read. The global augmented and virtual reality market is expected to hit $16.8 billion in 2019, according to Statista. As the technology advances, VR in the gaming space becomes more realistic and in some cases more scary. The Exorcist Legion VR is an interactive take on the cult classic horror film. And in the spirit of the holiday, here's a preview. <laughs> Okay, we're now joined by Doug Neighbors, <laughs> producer of The Exorcist Legion VR. Okay, Tim and I are both already scared. Doug, walk us through this experience. What is the story you're going to be experiencing? Sure. Well, this is based on, um, obviously, The Exorcist franchise. Um, we uh, focus particularly on the third uh, film in the franchise, The Exorcist 3, which was originally titled Legion. And uh, it's, you start off at, in a uh, police department, so this kind of has the framework of a police procedural, like very much like a television series. And slowly you begin to uncover clues about a, a heinous murder in a, um, in a church, and uh, you, uh, you start to sort of take on the mantle of an exorcist and face a variety of sort of demon demonic entities in a path towards your final confrontation with Pazuzu, who we all know from the from the Exorcist. Right, right, and you're obviously very specific, Doug, with, with which, which edition of The Exorcist you chose. Why this one for a VR experience? Why is the horror genre a good fit? Um, it's <laughs> terrifying for me, I have to yep. tell you. I've done some, some horror VR stuff, and it was like really terrifying. <laughs> well, we, we chose this particular uh, um, uh, film in the franchise just because it, it seemed to fit well into our episodic model. And, uh, our company, Fun Train, produces specifically episodic VR experiences. So, first of all, that this one fit just fit perfectly into our our uh, mold. But also, in, as far as horror in virtual reality, we it's just, I mean, kind of kind of seeing is believing with this stuff. But uh, horror just works so incredibly well and can give you that immediate scare and that immediate sense of uh, fear that you can't really get anywhere else, whether it be on television or films. It's just uh, it's so immersive. In fact, we have. We've, we've had many reports of people not being able to make it all the way through. My own brother, in yeah. fact, can't make it all the way through Yeah, this well, experience. that makes two of us right now. Yeah, I don't think I can really make it through this make interview. It. Yeah, well, a lot of <laughs> no companies, offense. though, a lot of companies are trying to figure out, right, what's the right and the best use case for virtual reality. You've worked in entertainment for almost 20 years. Yeah. Why did you decide to tap into VR? Well, it, it, I put a headset on about four or five years ago, and it pretty much blew my mind. I, I was, um, I've been working in film and television, as you said, for quite a while. And I just, I saw this, I saw, once, I, once I sort of got bitten by the bug, I realized that virtual reality is the next step in, in the entertainment medium. You know, it's, it's, hmm. the, it's the proscenium dissolves. There's no, more, there's no more screen in the movie theater. There's no more frame around your television, but it's, you're in it and it's all around you. And I, that, to me, was, you know, as someone that's always trying to give audiences a more and more sort of compelling and immersive experience, this just seemed like the perfect, perfect fit for us. I, and, I, um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious, now that you've spent four or five years immersed in this world, what do you see as the future of VR beyond entertainment? How do you think it'll impact people's lives? Mm. That's, that's a great question. Um, news media, for example. I mean, uh, right now, as you know, we're dealing with these... Los Angeles has these, these terrible fires. And it's one thing to see it on a YouTube screen, or it's one thing to see it on a, on a television screen. But um, I really see virtual reality taking a role, a, a sort of more active role in news media, uh, and actually putting users in the midst of that fire in 360 degrees all around them live. And I think that that's not very far away at all. I mean, I was just, I attended a Post Malone concert live the other night in virtual reality 
on the Oculus Quest platform, and I was just blown away mm -hmm. by the possibilities. So not only, you know, there's news media, I, I fully expect the Chatter Network to be uh, <laughs> in, in the 360 virtual reality at some point in the future, in the near future. Yeah, Tim and I could just be in your living room bringing you the yeah. news, right? We'll do it. I mean, I got a chance couch. to play with Oculus Quest yeah. Please, over the weekend. Please, come over. <laughs> yeah. exactly. we'll, we'll be there. I'll be there in person, too, so be careful, Doug. Yes, okay. Doug, uh, <laughs> before we let you go, Doug, tell us the price tag on this particular Exorcist VR experience and what platforms can it be used on? Absolutely. So um, we, we sell episodically, um, so we have both options available to consumers. We can, you can either buy these one at a time, like you buy a television series. So those episodes of The Exorcist, there's five of them, and they run $4.99 to $6.99, depending on the platform. Then you can buy the complete series, which is $24.99 up to $29.99. And you can get these on a variety of uh, pretty much any major virtual reality headset we, we support uh, for all of our titles. And in fact, this is I've got one right here. This is an Oculus Quest. I don't know if you can see it. There you go. Uh, and this, um, we, we are on the Oculus Quest platform. We're on PlayStation in all regions. Uh, North America, Europe, even Japan. Um, we're on the Steam platform uh, for the Valve Index, et cetera. So we're, we're pretty much anywhere you can find uh, virtual reality. All right, that's Doug Neighbors, producer of the Exorcist Legion VR. Doug, thanks so much for your time today. Thanks, Doug. Well, coming up, the company that's on Thank a mission have. to humanize technology and bringing emotional intelligence into our everyday lives. It's right after this. Welcome back to Cheddar Innovates, brought to you by CuriosityStream. The category of Emotion AI is a subset of artificial intelligence that can understand, simulate, and react to human emotions. Emotion AI can be applied to multiple industries and business functions and is expected to become a multi-billion dollar industry. Our next guest is a leader in this category and is on a mission to make tech feel more human. Joining us now is Rana L. Kolyubi, the CEO of Affectiva. Rana, it's so great to have you on the show. How are you humanizing technology? Uh, thank you for having me. Very excited to do this. Uh, we are on a mission to humanize technology, and, and the premise is really very simple. If you look at how people communicate, only about 10% of how we, we communicate is in the actual words we use. 90% of it is nonverbal. It's in the facial expressions we use, our gestures, our vocal intonations. And right now, technology is completely oblivious to these nonverbal cues. And we're, we're basically building um, algorithms that can capture these facial expressions, vocal intonations. And then there's um, you know, a whole slew of applications of where you can integrate this type of uh, insights and, and data. 
Yeah, Rana, walk us through some of those applications. Specifically, what are some industries that humanized AI can disrupt? Um, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think at the, at the highest level, we really believe that this is going to become the de facto human machine interface. Uh, we're already seeing signs of that, so our, you know, our technologies are becoming a lot more conversational, and I think in the next few years we're going to see them become, uh, our devices become a lot more perceptual, so they'll have eyes and ears, if you like, um, and they will interface and interact with humans just the way we interact with one another through, you know, through emotions and through empathy. Um, Short-term, term, um, there are a lot of uh, industries that are already integrating this type of technology. So as one example, we partner with uh, market research firms that, um, and, and companies that really want to understand how do their, um, you know, the emotional engagement of their consumers, how do their consumers engage with their content, with their products. Um, and so um, that particular kind of advertising testing solution or content testing solution is, is deployed in almost 90 countries around the world. Yeah. So I guess yeah. I, for the uninitiated, give us an idea of how you build this technology and what exactly goes into it. Sure. Um, so the core technology is basically um, an algorithm that can uh, understand uh, the facial expressions of people. Um, and the way we train this is we use deep learning and computer vision and hundreds of thousands of examples of people smiling or smirking or frowning. And, and we uh, feed that data to the deep learning algorithm, and then it learns, you know, this repertoire of facial expressions, and it maps it to a number of emotions like joy or, you know, confusion or excitement. Um, and, and so, and, and it leverages any camera on, on, on your device. Um, it could be the camera on your phone or um, on your laptop. So it's pretty scalable as a technology. Rana, what is the next big goal for Affectiva? Yeah, we're really focused on the automotive industry right now uh, to improve road safety by understanding um, driver impairment, like uh, drowsiness or distraction, but also like just building an in-cabin sensing intelligence to really uh, figure out how many occupants are in the vehicle, what are they doing, what's their experience like, and partnering with car companies to improve that transportation experience. Um, so that's our big goal. We want to be in millions and millions of, of vehicles over the next few years. Well, if it can help with safety, I'm all for that. Rana El Kolyubi, CEO of Affectiva, thank you so much for joining us on Cheddar Innovates. And coming up, a new World Series champion has been named. So how is technology playing a role in America's favorite pastime? We'll find out next. Welcome back to Cheddar Innovates, brought to you by CuriosityStream. 
The new World Series champions have been named. The Washington Nationals took down the Houston Astros last night, taking home the team's first World Series win in franchise history. And as the 115th World Series comes to a close, we're going to take a look at how tech has been playing a major role in the major leagues. Well, athletes and trainers have been using virtual reality and other tools to step up their game. So how are the latest breakthroughs in science and technology helping younger players and rising stars. Curiosity Stream dives into Tech's role in predicting a pro. Take a look. Baseball, the great American pastime. For decades, the best shot young players had of making the majors was to catch the eye of a professional scout. What I look for is athleticism in the young kid. Kid can move, has good hands, does something special on the field. But a new day is dawning in sports recruiting. What used to be in the eye of the discerning beholder is now in the nerve center of a motherboard. I think technology has added another resource for coaches and players to make people better. What we can tell is how well the visual parts of the brain are connecting and talking to the movement parts of the brain. But is newer necessarily better Back in the day when I first started in the big leagues, it was basically, did you get guys out or didn't you get them out? Can technology take the place of humans in evaluating who should make the cut? He hit it dead on almost every single time. You could add 20, 30, 50 miles an hour just from here to there. Will science be able to predict the next great sports star? 64 miles an hour. How do you find a kid who doesn't really look like a great hitter, but he's really got that million dollar brain for recognizing pitches? And Predicting a Pro is available now only on CuriosityStream. Want more top-tier content on science, nature, history, and technology? Stay curious and head over to CuriosityStream.com to sign up today. And to tap into some of the history of the World Series, Tim and I are going to play a quick round of World Series trivia. Are you ready, Tim? I'm ready. Okay, first okay. question's for you. What year was the first World Series? 1908, I... 1898, 1903, or 1912? I'm going to say 1903. Why? Do you have a reason? Yeah, my reasoning is good. it's not the oldest. Yep. But it's oh. not, it's not, yeah, oh, and look. You are you were tapping into the psychology of whoever put this together. Yeah. I've got it. Okay, good okay, job, no, Tim. I, all right, thank you. You're a genius. Thank you. I, I'll take it. Uh, you're up. Okay, so which yeah. Yankee player had the most World Series rings? Babe Ruth, Yogi Berra, Derek Jeter, or Mickey Mantle? So I should say has or had. Has or had. Um, I'm going to go with not Yogi Berra. I'm going to do process of elimination. Okay. Not Babe Ruth. Okay. I don't know, Mickey Mantle. I don't think it's Is Derek it Mickey Mantle? I don't know. Oh, oh Yogi, Yogi Berra. Oh, You're man. Still a I love okay. Yogi Berra. Uh, well, that was fun. I guess you win because <laughs> it it's zero. No, we all win because we one. learned more, yes, okay? The Nationals win. That's yes, who really is. wins. Congrats <laughs> to that team. Okay, well, I guess that's going to do it for today's episode of Cheddar Innovates brought to you by Curiosity Stream. We'll be back next Thursday at 12.30 p.m. And stay with us for more Between Bells coming up next.